A gated D latch is a one bit memory device. The D stands for data. A gated D latch is also referred to as a data latch or simply a D latch. We're going to look at how a D latch can be built from a gated SR latch and examine its behavior with a timing diagram. Let's first remind ourselves of a potential problem associated with gated SR latches. Remember, a gated SR latch can be constructed from NAND gates. A gated SR latch is an active high latch. In other words, both S and R are normally at low voltage, representing zeros, and a pulse is required at one of these in order to set or reset the latch. Meanwhile, if the output at Q is high, the latch is set and it's storing a 1. But if Q is low, the latch is not set and it's storing a 0. The gated SR latch has a third input, E, which, when high, enables the latch. The latch is said to be transparent when it's enabled. As elegant as it is, we have a potential problem with this circuit. There's a possibility that S and R could be made high simultaneously. This would be like asking the latch to store a 1 and a 0 at the same time, which is nonsense. In reality, both Q and not Q would become high. Then, if both S and R fell to 0 at the same time, we'd have a race condition. The cross-connected NAND gates would race each other to feed back their outputs, making it impossible to predict the next state of the latch. This would be like tossing a coin. The latch would end up in either one of its two stable states. Needless to say, this kind of unpredictability in an electronic circuit is usually unacceptable. So what can we do about it? By simply inverting input S with a NOT gate, then feeding this NOT gate's output into R, so that R and S are always the opposite of each other, the forbidden input combination of S equals 1 and R equals 1 can never be applied. Now we can rename input S to D, D for data. And now we have a one input gated SR latch, otherwise known as a D latch. Let's see it in action. While E is high, if D is high, then so is Q. While E is high, if D changes to low, then so does Q. You can see that while E is high, Q is always the same as D. And because we're using a NOT gate like this, there's no possibility of the D latch ever ending up in a forbidden state, like an SR latch might. This is still a latch, of course, because if E falls to zero, output Q will retain its previous value. And the D latch will no longer respond to changes in D. It's locked in its current state. Let's return to our gated SR latch for a moment. By cleverly rewiring the same four NAND gates like this, we've built a D latch in a different way. It does exactly the same thing as the D latch that we built by using a NOT gate, but because we're using less components, this version is more efficient and cheaper to make. Let's look at both designs together. We can see that this new version is taking advantage of the fact that the output of the top NAND gate is always the inverse of D as long as the latch is enabled. So this output is fed back into the lower gate, a rather elegant solution. Let's quickly check it is indeed doing the same thing by tracing the highs and lows through the gates again. At the moment, E is high, D is high, and so is Q. E is still high, D goes low, and so does Q. E goes low, D and Q remain as they were, low. E is still low, D becomes high, but Q remains low. E becomes high again, D is already high, so Q goes high. Now let's examine the behaviour of a D latch on a timing diagram. This type of analysis might reveal some behaviour we haven't spotted yet. First though, we're going to give the D latch its own symbol, so we can focus on what it does rather than how it was built. We're interested in the relationship between D, E and Q. So here they are on a shared time axis. Not Q is always the inverse of Q, 
so we haven't included it on this diagram. At our starting point, E is high. In other words, the D latch is enabled. D is low and therefore so is Q. When D goes high, so does Q. When D goes low, so does Q. You can see that while E is high, Q is following D. When E goes low, Q is latched. It can't change. So we can see here changes in D are not being reflected in Q. D at the moment is low. Q is high. But when E goes high again, Q reflects D. And once again, Q is following D. On this diagram, we see E going low again, so Q is no longer following D. Until, of course, E goes high again. To summarise then, a D latch, otherwise known as a data latch, can be built from a gated SR latch, either by including a NOT gate or by simply rewiring the existing NAND gates. Regardless of how it was built, the D latch has its own symbol, and its behaviour can be described on a timing diagram. The essence of this behaviour is that the output follows the input while the D latch is enabled. If the D latch is disabled, it retains its current state. This means the D latch can be used to capture and store one bit of data. It's a one bit memory device. D latches are useful for converting parallel data into serial data. A group of D latches can hang on to several bits of data while a multiplexer accesses them one at a time and places them onto a serial transmission line. Typically, D latches are found in input output ports. One final point. Latches are sometimes referred to as flip flops, but strictly speaking, this is not correct. Latch circuitry does, however, form the basis of a flip flop, and I'll be looking at these later.